so now that we've talked about a transformation matrix and we've used my uh, kind of goofy video game example um, let's let's get rid of that um, and let's talk about a robot so now a robot is a fair it's it's different than the previous example of the video game where the video game had different frames but it's kind of similar um, I used the video game because I thought that would be you know a simple example um, but for the forward kinematic calculation to calculate you know basically the difference from here where uh, the center of the base is where our zero point is in our world frame as it's known um, and to know the XYZ yaw pitch and roll to know the difference you know the the transformation from there to there we have to apply a frame to each axis so um, the frame for axis one sits right on top of the zero world frame so if axis one rotates you know the only rotation you're gonna see on that one is Z um, and then up here on axis two we have a frame up here on axis three we have a frame on axis four we have a frame axis five and axis six so we have six frames and somehow through these frames we have to mathematically figure out what the difference is from here to here now this is referred to typically as the kinematic chain you know or, or the chain of frames um, you know from zero to your tool center point so this actually isn't too difficult um, as far as actually doing it because all you need is a 4 by 4 transformation matrix for each one of these and then you multiply the frame like I showed earlier in the earlier example only I only did a 3 by 3 in this case you do the same thing but a 4 by 4 matrix you multiply that matrix times this matrix and then the product of that you multiply it by this matrix and the product of that you multiply by this one and the product of that times this one and the product of that times that one until you come up with the full um, transformation matrix that represents this position in space um, and then that's that's basically that's the frame that you would use um, to define the position and the yaw pitch and roll um, now it gets a little bit um, complex because when we get into the inverse kinematics to be able to solve that problem uh, the inverse kinematics is is a very difficult problem to solve so to solve that problem they do something called um, kinematic decoupling so basically they take the wrist and mathematically they remove it from the robot and when they do that they calculate they use the three joints in the wrist to calculate the yaw pitch and roll and then they use axis one two and three to calculate the, the x y and z the position in space so that's how that problem is typically solved is by breaking the robot mathematically into two separate pieces um, that back. Um, and the only reason I mention that is because for the forward and the inverse kinematics to work together they have to work off the same premise that the um, that the center of axis 5 that is what's typically used to calculate the X Y and Z position of the robot so you're you're actually using the X Y and Z of this frame to calculate the X Y Z position in space and then you're using this frame um, to calculate the yaw pitch and roll um, and then if you were to do a more complex uh, calculation than what I've done for my robot you would you would multiply in that distance there to get the actual uh, you know offset there but for the sake of for the purpose of this example just uh, bear with me that the the center of the wrist is used to get the X Y and Z and the rotation of this frame is used for the yaw pitch and roll because of that kinematic decoupling that has to happen so um, so then the next thing is is that we need to create a 4x4 four four transformation matrix for each one of these axes and that sounds easy right but it's not um, to basically create um, a frame that shows the difference from this to this and then a frame that shows the difference from this to this um, you know there's there's some um, a little bit of magic that has to happen 
uh, to create a matrix that is properly distanced from here to here and the rotation is um, you know properly defined between each of these uh, axes so there's um, there's uh, the Denovit Hartenberg parameters which is a, a couple guys back in the 50s came up with a way to make this problem much easier so the Denovit Hartenberg parameters on this model are right here uh, for this robot and basically what the Denovit Hartenberg parameters do is they take us from having to use six parameters to be able to define those frames down to four parameters so it makes it uh, an easier equation to solve if we use this model um, the Denovit Hartenberg parameters um, those parameters are angle, link twist, link offset, and link length so when we plug in those values for J1 and then we plug in those values for J2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, you know, we'll have our complete set of Denovit Hartenberg parameters. And then once we have those parameters, we have to apply those to this DH transformation calculation here um, to create each of our frames for each joint. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a 4x4 four four transformation matrix for each joint. And that's going to basically, you know, for for joint one here, this matrix is going to is going to show you the difference between zero and and where joint one is at. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Denovit Hartenberg parameters. Um, there's there's some rules here um, to make this work, as I understand it. Um, basically, the first rule. Um, and let me pull up a wireframe model of the robot because we really need this to this to make sense. So this is a wireframe model of our robot. So pretend this guy is a six-axis robot, and we need to create a frame for this guy, a frame for axis two, three, um, uh, four. Uh, five and six. So, or excuse me, that's that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So to you know create this um, to create to apply the Denovit Hartenberg parameters to each of these um, to come up with uh, a four four by four matrix. Um, the first thing, the first rule that we need to understand is that for each of these frames, the z-axis is always the axis of rotation. So if we look really closely down here, you'll see that the axis pointing straight down, that's right there noted for this first zero frame, um, is, uh, and it shows right there that theta one, angle one, so this is actually joint one. Um, it shows the z-axis is the axis of rotation there. And then this frame up here represents axis two. So you can see right here it says theta two with a little blue circle indicating rotation. And you can see that the z-axis goes this way. And up here for theta three or axis three, you can see that the z-axis goes that way. So that continues on through the entire model. Um, you can see here the model kind of shows you that, um, see this is, um, theta 4, this is kind of representing axis 4 rotation, and then it shows um, axis f uh, 5 being the center. Remember I told you earlier that, you know, for kinematic decoupling, we, we use this large black frame as our actual uh, center point. Um, so um, you can see it's trying to, what it's trying to represent here is the spherical wrist. Um, by putting these frames over the top of each other, trying to put, um, trying to show, um, you know, basically four, five, and six all together here on, on one place. Um, but if you follow this throughout, you'll see that the z-axis is always the axis of rotation. So that's the first rule to make this little Denovit Hartenberg trick work, um, to make it easier for us to define these frames. Um, the second rule is that the x-axis is always perpendicular to and intersects the z-axis. So we know which way uh, the z-axis goes. Now we've got to figure out which way 
uh, the x-axis goes. Um, so in, in this example, um, the way it works is that the, um, the, for this one, let's say let's use um, axis 3 for an example, the x-axis here, uh, because remember z is rotation, the x-axis has to be perpendicular to and intersect the previous z-axis is uh, the way that I understand it. Um, so that is how we go through the entire kinematic chain and define the x direction. And then the, um, the final one, the y direction, is just simply um, basically using the right hand rule um, that um, if we use the right hand rule that the x always comes off of the, the other side there. Um, or excuse me, the y axis comes off the other side, so just using the right hand rule, the y has to come off the other, the other axis in that direction. Um, so those are the three basic rules um, to how these frames all have to be oriented, and then these parameters are kind of what show that or what define that, so that's how we, we define these. So this first column here, uh, labeled angle, that is the actual joint angle of each joint um, with one, uh, with one uh, difference that I'll, I'll come back to at the end. The link twist, uh, shown by that symbol there, what the, the link twist is, is um, it's, the, it's the angle between the z-axis along the x-axis. Uh, so, for example, you can see here mine is radians of negative 90, 0, it's radians of 90, minus 90, and 90. So our link twist is negative 90, 0, 90, minus 90, and 90. So the way that we get that is that axis 1, um, the z direction goes this way. Um, axis 2, they share, the x direction goes kind of in parallel to each other and then the z direction goes off that way so right there the difference between the z on this frame and the z on that frame is minus 90 so I'm just basically illust I'm basically showing the difference in rotation uh, in the z along the x from this one to this one and we go through that chain all the way down um, defining that link twist as it's called the next column of values is the link offset. It's usually shown with a D um, symbol. So the link offset, um, if we look at the D value on this model, the link offset from the base up to here is just that distance. So in my robot, in my plastic robot that I built, D is 169.77 millimeters. And then um, we've got um, uh, zero there, zero there, and then if we look at D4 up here, um, that value going backwards, going this direction, is negative 222.63 millimeters, and then the same thing with um, value D6, we can see up here D6, this distance on my robot is negative 36.25 coming from uh, 6 back. Um, and then on my robot, for example, you see here the value for for um, uh, for uh, D3. Um, let's find D3 on here. I'm sorry, forget that. Not not D3. I'm getting ahead of myself. What I meant to get into was let's go into the link length. So the length length for A1. If we um, look in here, we see A1. So that value on my robot is 64.2 millimeters. And then um, A2, that value right there from this distance to here is 305 millimeters. And what I was trying to talk about earlier was just to make the point that it was A3 that I was thinking of, not D3. A3, this value on mine, there is no A3. A3 is equal to zero because um, you can see on my robot, it goes right through the center of it. There's no shoulder offset. I don't have, 
you know, the axis three um, up or you know, axis four above axis three. So on mine, it goes right through there. So um, in my case, you know, this arm actually comes straight through here. So there is no A3. So for example, A3 is zero. I just wanted to make that point. A lot of people build robots where the um, where this joint is actually up higher, and so in, in most kinematic models, A3 does have a value, and I just wanted to point that out. So basically, um, to kind of sum up the uh, you know setting the DH parameters here, um, we basically have a table here of values based on the rules of the the kinematic of the DH model. So we have a bunch of parameters that are based on these rules that kind of define this frame. So kind of think of think of these numbers as all the numbers that make this wire frame right here.